Hi, I'm James Robinson, and this is my stock pick of the week. My goal when I created this blog is to create a community of people who are interested in value investing, a place where we can openly trade ideas and give each other advice. I don't claim to have all the answers, though I feel like I've done my share of homework. So if you like the blog or find it interesting, please drop me a note in comments. Of course, subscribing and liking are also great as they help me get exposure and build a community. Thank you for watching. My pick of the week is simply a stock that I think represents a great buy that week. My criteria for what makes a great stock is very simple. I look for great companies with a durable competitive advantage and or extremely good returns on invested capital. Only after I find companies that, that qualify under that criteria do I look at the stock price to see if they're fairly priced. My definition of a great company and a durable competitive advantage come directly from my study of Warren Buffett and the various investors in his orbit people he would call the super investors of Graham and Doddville. It starts with the book Security Analysis written by Ben Graham and David Dodd. What I do not do is look for the next great thing. I love Tesla, but not its stock. I'm sure there's a solar company or self-driving car company or super duper gadget company where a $10,000 investment today could make me a billionaire in six months. But I don't know how to find those, so I don't look. I simply look over and over again at company after company looking for companies that are great. And then I watch those companies for when the stock prices become attractive. That's all I do. Thank you for watching. My pick of the week this week is Robert Half, RHI. Robert Half International provides staffing and risk consulting services in North America, South America, Asia, Europe, and Australia. The company has three segments, temp and consultant staffing, permanent placement staffing, and risk consulting slash internal audit services. RHI has 18,900 full-time employees and it's based in Menlo Park, California. As of June 27, 2019, the company had a market cap of 6.6 .6 billion. Its revenues were 5.8 billion. Its profits were 447 million. It had a PE ratio of 15.01, a yield of 2.24% and had debt of $277 million. As always, I rank a company in 29 categories, 10 of which are management, 10 of which are financial, nine of which are operating. Operating basically is how good a job the company does in delivering goods and services to its customers. Financial is how well the company does in terms of managing risk and, uh, and its debt load. And management is what kind of job the company does in terms of returning profits to us, the shareholders. This is one of the highest rated companies. In fact, it's in the top 15 of the 900 companies that I've ever looked at. Total GPA of 3.45, uh, uh, and it's above a 3.0 in all three categories, operating, management, financial. In, it, this is a company I've been waiting for its stock to drop for a very long time. I love the company. Uh, and it's actually at the high end of its PE ratio that I would consider investing in. But it's such a solid company uh, for reasons we're gonna see that I'm happy to suggest that it's something you should buy today. So gross margins, um, this company, one of the most important things for me is gross margins. Again, I've talked about this before, but I look at this as altitude. The higher the gross margins, the more the company's ability to withstand something going wrong. It's kind of like if you're flying in an airplane, if you're a few feet off the ground and something goes wrong, you don't have any time to react or maneuver. But if you're at 50,000 feet or 30,000 feet, you have quite a bit of time to find a safe place to land or to fix the problem. So I like gross margins. I like high gross margins in companies. Um, you know, 40% gross margins is sort of my number that I really consider the desirable number. Uh, not many companies are able to achieve that, uh, but Robert Half is one of those companies that is. So here you can see the company's earnings, um, and they're pretty solid. They obviously got killed from 2007 uh, for several years, and you can imagine being a staffing company, being a company that does employment, uh, when the economy takes a dive, this company is going to really get hurt because people are working to shed workers, not hire new workers. And they're certainly not looking for temps, they're looking to get rid of people. Um, but since 2009, the company's profits have gone up every year with the exception of two. Uh, but the trend has been steady and upward. Uh, the trend has been slightly steeper when you look at uh, earnings per share, and that's simply because the company has managed to buy back a significant amount of shares. But we'll talk more about that in a future slide. So net earnings as a percentage of revenue. This number is very, very low, um, but there's some reasons for that. Uh, the biggest thing is the way that they're comp that they they take their revenue. They, if you, I did analysis of manpower, and we had the same problem. 
um, that, that manpower, because they are a temp agency, they oftentimes are collecting wages for their people and then paying the people out those wages. And the result is significantly smaller compensation. I'm sorry, significantly smaller uh, net earnings out of gross revenues. But we're gonna look past that because everything else in this chart for this company, everything else in the company's charts look fantastic. So selling and general administrator for this company also is high. And that again is just due to the nature of its business and its industry. Uh, they have to spend a lot of time selling. They have a lot of administrative tasks because they're constantly having to interview people and hire and select people to be temps. And that's a very time intensive process. You can't really automate that very well. And so that's the reason this company's selling general administrator are so high. It's almost like some of this could be considered R&D costs because they're R&D, they're researching and developing people. Um, but again, I'm not worried about it and you'll see why as the future slides. The next item, plant and equipment. The company is in the top 25% for plants and equipment. Really, they just have a bunch of office space. They don't have any, any real plants and they don't have any warehouses, for example. So the big offset to high S uh, selling general administrative is that the company has absolutely no in, no inventories that is sucking up their capital, and they also have no R and D costs. So again, we looked at the R and D. You need to look at all these these four taxes. I talk, I call them the four taxes: selling and uh, general administrative, plants and equipment, inventory, and R and D. Every company seems to have some components of that in their business, um, and you're trying to make sure that they're not out of whack, and you're trying to make sure that all four of them together aren't out of whack. Um, and so this company has nothing in inventory, nothing in R&D, relatively low in plants and equipment, but they're a little high in this in, in selling and general administrative. But the net story is that none of their costs are really gonna kill the company. The company effectively has no long-term debt, and as a result, it doesn't have any real interest expense. So interest expense in total and interest expense in terms of um, operating income are both in significant numbers. Uh, they're very, very low, approaching zero. And so uh, this is this is you know this is why this company is going to get a four star rating in in almost every financial category. Here you can see current liabilities are going up, but again we've talked about that they're going up because the company is managing to grow revenues, is managing to grow uh, profits, and so you know current liabilities are things like office space rents, um, copier rentals. Uh, your current liability might be uh, outstanding payroll. So. These things are going to go up as you get more profitable, but it's not necessarily a negative. In fact, it's almost a positive. Long-term debt, again, is effectively zero, and that's really what we care about. Um, and the total debt, of course, is going to match your total current liabilities when there's no long-term debt. Here's income to pay off long-term debt. Effectively, it's zero. So we look at anything under four years to pay off long-term debt is a great idea. I mean, it's a great company. This company is effectively zero, so it's gonna get a four-star rating. You know, I wanna talk about one of the things that happens when a company has no debt. A company has no debt, that really means they have sort of a pent-up ability to borrow money. So if they had an opportunity to make a big acquisition that made sense, then they could go do that. If the economy turns on them, they could borrow some money to get them through the tough times if they had an opportunity to buy a headquarters building. For, there are a number of things that a company can do if it has no debt, that it can eventually call on that money if it needs to. Now you juxtapose that with a company that has a bunch of debt. They have an inability to borrow more because they've already tapped that resource. And when things go wrong, they've got an interest expense that they have to pay on top of it. So it's kind of a double benefit for a solid company to have no debt in terms of looking at it as, a, as purely an investment. Interest coverage ratio is a meaningless number when you don't pay any interest. So I should almost slip this, skip this slide and that's really all I'm gonna say on it. Cash and marketable securities. Um, this number has been going down since 2004. It's really remained pretty level since 2010. Um, the company has more than enough money to pay off its uh, current liabilities, which is something we care about. Um, I'd, I guess I would like to see this number come down even lower, but I think they need some sensible reserves. So I'm not really bothered by this. I'd be more bothered if they were hoarding cash and not giving it to us as dividends and stock buyback. but. As you see, they are doing those things, so I'm, I'm, this number is kind of irrelevant to me. So here you can see current assets. The, the difference between current assets and the last slide, which is cash, cash equivalents and marketable securities, is current assets includes all of those things, but it also includes money that you're supposed to be paid within the year. So the idea is you want your current assets, which is money you're supposed to be paid within the year, to be greater than your current liabilities, which is money that you owe for the, for the coming year. 
And you can see in this company, they seem to have a nice little buffer of four or five hundred million dollars that just is always in place every year, year in and year out. That gives them a nice safety valve between their current assets and their current liabilities. So just a very, very, very well managed company in that atri in, in that respect. As a shareholder, this really warms my heart. Shares outstanding. Um, every year, this company's bought back stock, kind of a sensible number, chunk, 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 chunk. Uh, they've gone from uh, 180 million shares in 1999 to you know something around 110 or 120 million shares today, um, and it's just very consistent. They just keep buying back shares, which means that I own a larger portion of the company every year. Um, you're going to see since in the last 10 years, they bought back about 25% of the company. Um, you know, what's not to love about that? So here's sort of the way to look at the share buybacks. If you had owned 10% of the stock, of Robert Half stock in 2018, it would have cost you about 15.16. You'd, you'd have bought about 15.16 million shares of stock. Today, through stock repurchases, if you hadn't sold any shares, those same 15.16 million, which, was, which did represent 10% of the company, today would represent 12.58% of the company. So that effectively means they bought back almost 26% of the company in the last 10 years. Uh, which even more interesting is that your share of the company's earnings would have gone from about $3.7 million. That's how what your 10% of the company's profits would be worth, $3.7 million of company profits. And today that you would be in, you'd have sort of your owner's share of $54.63 million. So they bought back a bunch of stock, They've made you a larger owner of the company, and the company itself is about 20 times as large, it was about 15 times as large as it was, you know, plus you've got 30% more stock. So this is really a fantastic long-term hold, this company. So is this the stock repurchase of weren't enough? This is the, uh, the dividends and dividends per share. Both are fantastic. Uh, both are going up at about 11% a year. And, you know, what's not to love about this, this chart, right? I mean, any time a stock, is, uh, a company's dividends go up at this kind of rate, um, you just have to love it. But let's dig deeper into looking at the company's dividends. Generally, I look at four factors when analyzing dividends. I look at the yield and growth, see what's happening there. I look at the dividend safety in the context of earnings. I look at the dividend safety in the context of cash flow, which is sometimes a little more accurate. And then I look at dividend safety in the context of its current debt load. Although in this case, again, the debt load is insignificant and approaching zero. So we're not gonna worry about that. Yield and growth, the company's yield is 2.24%. The average yield for the S&P 500 is 1.92%, so it's about 10% above, 15% above the yield for the average S&P 500 company, that's good. But what's great is that the average dividend growth has been 11.8% over the last five years. That is, uh, that is fantastic. We love, uh, you know, if, if, if you had enough money in the stock to pay all your bills, you get it. 12% raise every year. Um, we love that kind of thing, and that's why I think this, is, again, is a good long-term hold company. So let's talk about the payout ratio. The payout ratio is what percentage of the company's profits are they paying out in dividends. The higher the payout ratio gets, the, more, the less margin of safety there is for something to go wrong. If a company's paying out 100% of its profits in dividends and then had a bad year, they would have to either borrow money to pay dividends, which is bad, or reduce the dividends. And people don't like it when companies reduce dividends. It always causes the sh almost always causes the shares of the company to drop in to drop significantly. So we like companies that have a payout ratio that allows them to retain some earnings for future use. In this case, it allows them to buy back some shares, but also allows them to have that safety margin where they can continue to raise dividends year in and year out and, and have no risk of reducing the dividend payment. So the average payout ratio here is 31.4%. To give you a sense, the S&P 500 average is 40%. The average payout ratio for the last five years is 33.6%. So even though this company's been raising its dividends by 10 or 11% a year, they're still paying dividends out relative to the S&P 500 at a slower pace. And they're paying out lower this year than they have over the last five years. So this company has plenty of room to play to pay, continue to pay us dividends and to continue to grow those dividends. So this is, gives us real, real comfort in terms of the safety of the dividend. The next slide, dividend safety in the context of cash flow. Um, so cash flow in 2018, cash flow from operating activities was $575 million, $572 million. The company has virtually no capital expenditures, which is one of the things I really like about this company is it doesn't have a big capital expense. 
spent $42 million in capital expenses, which means it had free cash flow, $529 million. It paid $136 million in dividends, which means that the company spent about 25% of its free cash flow on dividends. Uh, the, uh, it's, the, it was 25.7 last year, and over the last five years, it's been 30%. You know, this is fantastic. This is hyper safe. Uh, we love this company because of the way it, it, in large part, because it has, one of the great things I love about this company is that it has such low capital expenditures, and it's got such a safe dividend. As we've already said, the debt load is so low and insignificant that it's not really worth worrying about the fact that the interest is going to get so high, it's going to swamp our dividend. It, unless the company bores a bunch of debt, which is a bigger problem, the uh, interest rates are not going to hurt our company's ability to pay us dividends. Shareholder equity has been sort of stable since about 2006. But again, that doesn't bother us because when the company takes cash to buy back shares, that cash is reducing our equity. But we're still being able to be rewarded because we own a larger percentage of the company. So this, this slide doesn't bother me at all. This, I, I'm not worried. Oftentimes, you'd like to see shareholders' equity increasing over time. Um, but it would increase over time if you looked at shareholders' equity um, as shareholders' equity per share. Return on assets. This is really, really important. This is like my company, any company is holding a certain amount of my cash as an owner and it's calling those cash assets. And then it's throwing off a certain amount of profits off those assets that it's keeping. And I like it to be doing a really good job of that. I think that's a really important thing for a company to do. So since 2011, the company has been uh, significantly above the top 10% in this, in terms of all building, in terms of the thousand companies, 950 companies that I've looked at. So, um, this is an A+. Plus. It's an A++ plus plus in terms of return on assets. So return on shareholders' equity uh, is really the same sort of look at the company's ability to use uh, assets intelligently. However, um, shareholders' equity includes the concept of how much debt does the company have. Remember, when a company has debt, that reduces the equity. If it makes the same amount of profit with less equity, um, then the return on equity is higher. So you get rewarded for debt with shareholders' equity. Uh, and that's why it's so impressive this company is able to consistently be around the top 10% of, of companies in terms of return on shareholders' equity, even though it has no debt. It doesn't have any sort of steroids to boost its performance. So this is an exceptionally good chart for this company. It's something that really does uh, make me, you know, make me really love the company. All right, so in summary, the first question I like to ask about a company is, does it have a consumer monopoly? I don't think it's fair to say that it does. There's a lot of companies out there that are temporary company, temporary temp agencies and consulting companies. Um, so, but it has a, a marginal one in that it's so big, right? It's in all, it's in every continent. It's around, I guess, except Africa. It's around the world. So most companies that are very, very large are looking sort of for sort of a one-stop shop. They can go to one place, sign a contract, and have temp services around the country and around the world. So in that sense, it has somewhat of a monopoly, but I wouldn't say it's a big enough one. It's certainly not big enough to interest me in buying the company. Um, I'm interested in the company because I think it's solid financially. It takes, uh, you know, it has debt of less than six months of profit, so effectively zero debt. Um, it's, it also does a good job of returning its owners. Uh, it pays an above market dividend. The dividend grows at 11.8%. It's bought back almost 30% of its stock since 2018. Companies have been the company's earnings have been increasing. It has very very low, um, very very low uh, costs for capital improvements, um, and it has very very high returns on assets and very very high returns on equity. And so those are the big reasons why I would buy this stock. So its current price of fifty five point four seven is absolutely a buy, and I think you should jump on the, on the company. So here you can see the companies that we've suggested or I've suggested you should buy. Um, the companies that are in green, in this case, Altria and H&R Block, are companies that we bought and we told you to sell and take your profits. So we had owned uh, Altria for 56 days and made about 20% on it. We'd owned H&R Block for 68 days and made almost 16%. Um, total, we've made about $1,800 $1, on our investments. Um, you know, it looks like some of these companies are going to do fine. It looks like T Row we might get out of relatively quickly. Um, same thing goes for um, Phyllis 66. Some of the companies are hovering around zero. And I've got a couple of losers. Hopefully, those will turn around. Uh, Argon Technologies. Um, Altria showing up here as a loser. Let me talk about that for a minute. 
when we sold Altria, we kept our profits invested in the company because we liked the dividend so much, we just took the initial investment back. Um, but now Altria has dropped down to below where it was or virtually below where it was when we bought it in the first place. So it's very likely that I'll buy back, I'll reinstitute a position in Altria because I like the dividend and because um, it's the prices drop so significantly. Um, but basically this is where we are. Hopefully we'll see these stocks that have kind of taken a little bit of a dump uh, get better and better over the next few weeks. And um, we'll talk more about that later. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching and please don't forget to uh, subscribe and to like. Thank you very much.